Hey everybody, it's the Plant-Based Business Hour. I'm so happy to have you with me today. Oh my word, could it be that ESG investing and philanthropy form a Venn diagram and that there's overlap in there somewhere? In other words, is it possible to do well by doing good? Let's see. I want to speak with one of the foremost grant uh, recommenders, if that's the right expression. We'll find out if that's the right expression. Uh, from the Open Philanthropy Project, Louis Bollard, thank you for being with me today. Great. Thank you for having me on. First, I want to just level set and explain to people what is the Open Philanthropy Project, and then we can talk about sort of globally what you do, and then we'll drill down to see just how much is done in animal welfare and why. But Open Philanthropy Project, most people haven't heard about it. Sure. Yeah. So we're the foundation of one of the Facebook co-founders, Dustin Moskowitz, and his wife, Kerry Tuna. And uh, their goal with their philanthropy was to do the greatest good they could in the world. And they've taken a pretty um, analytical approach to trying to work out the ways to have uh, the greatest impact they can uh, for animals, for humans, for future generations. Um, and so really taking kind of a step back and trying to work out those places where we can have the greatest impact in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this. How old is Open Philanthropy Project? Yeah, we're about eight years old. Um, so we spun out of, a, of another organization, GiveWell, that was focused on helping people in extreme poverty. And we broadened our remit. So we still do that work, um, but we broadened it to working on a number of other issues too. And that, that's been about uh, an eight-year process. Mm -hmm. So I just want to read some of these because I want to give people the scope of what you do. So um, immigration policy, I'm getting this off the website. So some things right. may have changed, but this is what I have off the website. Sure. Immigration policy, land use reform, macroeconomic stabilization policies, biosecurity and pandemic preparedness. We talk about that a lot on this show. Effective altruism, focusing on community growth. So powerful. There are potential risks from advanced AI. Maybe we'll get into that today with the onset of chat GPT and auto GPT. Uh, effective out uh, sorry farm animal welfare global aid policy global health and development scientific research and south asian air quality so very diverse how did they and i assume it was the two of them that put these parameters in place or maybe they had consultants how did they decide on so many varied and not necessarily working in conjunction together philosophies yeah i think it's quite unique to open philanthropy that the remit from the founders and, and, and the funders was to really just try and do the most good we could in the world and mm. to analyze for ourselves uh, where we could do the most good. And so three criteria that we've looked to a lot are the potential scale of an issue. So how many humans or, or animals are affected by it, um, how tractable it is, to what degree we think we can achieve change in our lifetimes, mm. and also how neglected it is. And so you see issues on there that you know aren't necessarily being covered by other funders and that's something that's really appealing to us, to find issues that are being ignored by other funders uh, where we think there might be outsized opportunities for impact because those, those opportunities are just being left on the table by others. Mm -hmm. um, and is that how like South Asian air quality, that might be something that's personally um, meaningful and also not something that I see a lot in a mandate for grants? Yeah. So, so in fact, none of these are based off the personal interests of the funders. All of them come oh. from um, the team of people they put to work on analyzing where they could have the greatest impact. And so if you look at something like South Asian air quality, huge problem that gets very little attention. So just terrible air quality across India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, causes lots of health, health problems. Really no other philanthropy focused on it. Uh, very little attention being paid to it. And so it kind of fit that profile of the issue we're looking for, where we think we could achieve real change. There's no one else out there doing something about it. Mm -hmm. So let's drill down a little bit into animal welfare. So I love what you're saying. We go for the areas where we can have the most impact with our dollars. I think although you would consider yourself a um, philanthropist or, or um, executing philanthropic goals, uh, investors see the same thing. They want to see where can I get the most return for my my inputs, that can be money, that can also be energy, time, research, etc. So um, why did they decide, because I had assumed wrongly that they were intimately passionate about animal welfare, but if that's not the case, what was the research or data that pointed the team towards this is where we can have the most impact? And is that impact animal lives or is it how animal lives impact human lives? 
Yeah, it's a great question. It really is the data and the research that that drove open philanthropy toward this issue of, of focusing on on farm animals uh, and, and their well-being. And that was driven first by the scale of mm-hmm. factory farming globally. So just the sheer number of um, of animals involved in the factory farming system, about 30 billion land animals alive at any point in time, over 70 billion fish being farmed at any point in time. And as you're you know, obviously very aware, the conditions those animals are being tracked Treats kept in are often abysmal. Uh, we also saw that this is something that other foundations weren't doing a lot about. There was very little philanthropic attention being paid to factory farming and the treatment of animals. And we saw it as a tractable issue, one where we think we can make some real progress uh, in alleviating the worst of those conditions and promoting alternatives to reduce the demand for factory farm products. Um, and so, yeah, it really was about the animals. Uh, I mean, we, we obviously care also about the, the climate implications, the... the um, zoonotic disease implications. But I think at the end of the day, this is about fundamentally um, the treatment of of billions of animals and and how we can do something about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's powerful. So in the eight years that you've come to focus on animal welfare and, you know, so many more animals, as you note, on the planet um, in factories, people sometimes say factory farming. And I say, well, hold on. That's an insult to farmers. These, These are animal factories, there's not farms by any stretch of the imagination. Um, what kind of impact have you been able to make in those years? Yeah, great question. So uh, I think there are a couple of things that we're most excited about the impact we've been able to have. So one has been on pushing companies to adopt uh, better animal welfare policies. And so we've had a lot of success in supporting advocacy globally to push the world's largest food companies, the biggest retailers, the biggest fast food companies to adopt meaningful animal welfare standards to get rid of some of the worst practices in factory farming, like battery cages used to confine laying hens, uh, like the terrible genetics that meat chickens, broiler chickens are, are um, condemned to, to, to live their lives with. And, um, We've seen a lot of success on the alternative protein side and promoting alternatives to factory farm products. So just seeing the the significant expansion we've seen in that industry uh, over the last few years globally. And we're also seeing increasing uh, signs of legislative progress. So the European Union now is revising uh, its full set of laws around farming, including its uh, farm animal welfare standards for the first time in about 20 years. Um, so I think we're seeing some really exciting progress globally. It's obviously far from enough, um, but I do think things are looking a lot better than they were uh, in the space even just five, 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. So for me, this is an area that has a lot of overlap with ESG investing. So we talk about it on this show, but environment, social and government, it's principles in one's investment portfolio. So when one invests for returns, one also invests to do the most good they can while getting those returns, kind of similar to what Dustin and Kari, uh, your founders were saying with Open Philanthropy Project. So investors look to how can they sort of pull up as they go up, for lack of a better expression. And you see that people are, maybe I'm just Pollyanna here, but animal welfare seems to be coming into the cultural conversation, the general cultural zeitgeist, more often than not. Do you see a shift in how the world is perceiving animal welfare and making it, I can't say a priority, but it's on their radar? Is that accurate? Yeah, I think it's definitely getting a lot more attention than it did previously. I think uh, you're seeing a lot of, of opinion leaders uh, talking about factory farming more, talking about the treatment of animals. I think you're starting to see this in just about every uh, major company globally now at least has an animal welfare policy. Now, a lot of them uh, aren't anywhere near sufficient, but but there's a recognition they need to have that policy. And I think there's a recognition that this is a core component of sustainability. And that's something we've seen, uh, particularly in the European Union, around current conversations about climate change, conversations about ESG, is that there's a recognition that animal welfare and how we treat animals is, is a core component of those sustainability discussions. Mm -hmm. I find when I have those conversations on Wall Street, it is still very much compartmentalized to animal welfare has direct negative impact on people. So high risk of pandemics, according to the United Nations, the top three reasons for the next pandemic are all related to eating meat with the top two reasons being the intensification of factory farming. So that has a clear implication on society. If you are experiencing a negative portfolio now, it's due to quantitative tightening. That's due to quantitative easing 
And that came about because of a pandemic. So your portfolio directly invested from pandemics. So I'm having these kind of conversations. You see how the animal welfare sort of starts to move into the rear view mirror. But I'm encouraged that it's part of the conversation. They're making these connections. How much do you have to make these connections for for people when you're out there talking in the public? Or do you not have to do that? You just say, no, I'm here for animal welfare, period, and stop. Yeah, I mean, I think I think most people have a recognition that animals' lives and interests matter, and it's mm-hmm. it's not top of mind for most people on a daily basis what's what's going on on factory farms. But I think that most people have that sense that it's not okay to just torture uh, millions or billions of, of animals, and and so I think for a lot of people, it's it's recognizing the ethical views they already hold and that they already do think it's important that we treat animals well. They think it's important that we, we don't do the kinds of things that are done in factory farms uh, and drawing that connection to their everyday behavior. And so, you know, in the case of, of companies saying, hey, as a, as a company, you have the ability to do something positive about this by adopting a better policy. As an investor, you have the uh, ability to do something better about this by changing what you invest in and, and changing how you engage with those companies. Um, so, you know, I don't think it's top of mind for most people, but I think it's definitely there. I think it's a pretty... Uh, widely held value that um, animals' interests matter and and that uh, we we shouldn't be torturing them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love this. And then I'll I'll quote Jane Goodall, who really makes that perfect triangle of you can't divorce people, animals, and the planet. They all live together. The biodiversity of the planet is a part of the health of the planet. Obviously, we cannot exist as a species without a healthy planet. These things are interconnected. They are a triangle and you can't divorce one from the other. So I don't want to make it always back about people, but it is really hurting oneself in the foot to not acknowledge that if you burn down your own planet, you have no place to live. So they are um, one in the same. Although I, I do see in my world that particularly younger generations, they're starting to say, hey, this isn't okay. And it reminds me of a conversation I had with Josh Balk when he was at the Humane Society, saying that they had done a study and they had polled both Republicans and Democrats I swear to God, this is probably the only subject upon which they both agree, but both had voted, even if it were more expensive, to better the lives of animals in factories. Both uh, parties were against animal torture. So, you know, that's an olive branch. Yeah, no, I agree. I think this is one of the rare issues that has not yet become uh, totally partisan. And uh, I hope I hope it remains that way. I think it's I think it's just true that this is a common value for most people, that they're, they're opposed to animal abuse, they're opposed to animal cruelty. Uh, they don't think that, that um, we should be able to do whatever we want with animals, whatever we want with the environment. Uh, and so, yeah, I really do think that uh, this is something that, you know, if you actually ask people about it on a daily, if you, you ask consumers, if you ask um, investors or others, I think it's something they personally care about. And mm-hmm. I think sometimes we need to do the work to, to, force the issue, I guess, up the kind of salience ladder to, to get this in front of people, to make sure people are remembering about it when they make decisions that affect animals. Um, but I think it's something that people already really care about. Mm-hmm. And I also think the time is now. We have a little bit of a perfect storm. So we have the pressure from clearly a stressed food supply system. We saw the global food supply system break down during COVID. You saw it break down again during the uh, the Ukraine-Russian war, which is obviously still going on. You see these uh, national tensions rise through uh, trade negotiation breakdowns between the U.S. and China. Can't really negotiate hard against your opponent if they control your food. So China quickly getting into alternative proteins, trying to stabilize its own food security. These become issues of national security. Though you see planetary problems, you see political problems, you see lack of water everywhere, let alone climate refugees. These are all intertwined to factory farming because of its use of land, disproportionate use of land, disproportionate use of water. And you start to see that this inefficient system of feeding ourselves is creating large scale problems that are coming to a pinnacle and we're going to have to do something about it. So that is something that's kind of top of mind right now. But at the same time, you know, you can't say, oh gosh, stop driving your car. It has fossil fuels. You have to give them an electric electric mm-hmm. vehicle. Right. Then, then you have a replacement and we now have food replacements. Mm-hmm. So those need to scale. They need to be more prolific. 
funders like you are helping make that happen. Um, but, you know, we have the apparent breakdown in front of our eyes. It's here today. And we have the replacement here today. So you're seeing all these things come together. I know in the investment world, we do this when we tell people along with fair farm animal investment risk and return, we say, gosh, there are risks on the balance sheet of potential stranded assets of these huge CAFOs, um, con uh, confined animal farming, what, what's wrong with me, CAFO, C confined animal farming operation. operation. <laughs> uh, you know, the I'm, I'm from Illinois, so GBS was fined for dumping into rivers in Illinois and the um, state and federal uh, politicians were um, going up against JBS for all the pol pollution they had done to those surrounding um, communities and how they just went in and destroyed them basically. So um, you're, you're seeing this kind of behavior no longer allowed. And um, from the investment standpoint, we say, hey, you know, if you want to get out of investing and things like that, well, then come over to us at VegTech Invest and we can get you into things that are replacing and changing. Um, so I think a lot of things are happening at the right time for it to really crystallize in people's minds. What do you think about that? I think that's right. I think it's, it's exactly as you cited this, this kind of perfect crisis of concern about zoonotic diseases, concern right. about animals, concern about climate change, concern about food security. Uh, and all of these point to the unsustainability of what we're doing. Uh, it, it, you know, we, we just can't have factory farming on an ever greater scale globally. We can't meet the world's appetite for protein through more and more factory farming. It, it's already uh, got so many horrible externalities that only gets bigger if we expand it. And so I think uh, you're right. We need we need alternatives. And I think one of the most exciting alternatives has been uh, the, the growth of plant based products, fermented products, cultured meat products. Uh, where you, you can bring about a lot of the positive things that people want to see in, in, in meat. So the taste, the texture, uh, the convenience, uh, and but without the harm. And I think that that's, yeah, I think that's been a really exciting trend. I think it's just going to remain an exciting one. And I think it's something that can, can only grow bigger over time. I mean, you know, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of volatility in that market, but I think it's in, in the long run can only get bigger because it, it's so aligned with the directions that we need to go in uh, as, as, as a people uh, and as a globe. Mm -hmm. I would encourage people to go back to a previous episode with senior food analysis of Bloomberg Intelligence, Jen Bartashis. She basically says the same thing, but puts some investor data behind that conversation. So it's a really good one. I encourage everyone to, to go and look at it. So we're at this perfect storm and you are there funding for real change. Tell me about some of the projects that you invest in and how you came to choose those. Sure. So you know, one of the one of the first things we supported was work to push companies toward higher animal welfare standards in their supply chains, and this was really a recognition that companies had made have made a lot of progress on other aspects of sustainability. Had recognized that they needed to have climate policies, they needed to have policies about labor. Uh, really, had lagged far behind when it came to animal welfare and treatment of animals. And so, a lot of work we've been supporting has been elevating. Uh, the issue of animal welfare and supply chains, and particularly drawing attention uh, for consumers, investors, other key stakeholders for companies to the reality of what's going on currently and, and saying, this is not something you want your company to be part of, and you can do better than that. And so we've, we've seen um, a, a major push globally to get rid of some of the worst uh, aspects of factory farming. So to get rid of battery cages, which are these tiny microwave sized oven containers where they, they hold four to six chickens for their entire life, just in this tiny container. Uh, and so saying, let's get rid of those. Like there's, there's no need for those in this process. It's they're used because they're slightly cheaper than alternatives. Uh, and we've, we've seen, uh, the world, some of the world's biggest food companies, uh, commit to getting rid of battery cages in their supply chain globally. Um, so I think that's been one really exciting trend. And we think that work is already affecting hundreds of millions of animals. I mean, that's the scale involved that even just one company making a more progressive decision can lead to millions of animals, uh, suffering a lot less in, in these environments. Um, you know, another thing we've supported has been work to reduce the demand for factory farm products in the first place, and, and particularly to change that long-term growth trajectory we see, where ever-increasing uh, ever demand for protein globally just leads to this ever-increasing supply of factory farms. 
And on that side, we've, we've supported the Good Food Institute, which is a group uh, working globally to help promote alternatives to animal products, to try and uh, get the right policy framework in place, to support more governmental research, to improve those products, uh, and to, to stave off the kind of inevitable resistance we get from the, the industry laggards who, who want to just kind of keep doing the same thing they've always done. And so uh, we've already seen a whole lot of uh, attempts at state laws, uh, national uh, regulation challenges to, to try and shut down the alternative protein industry before it really gets off its feet. And so one of the things we've been doing is trying to push back against that and make sure that there's that the, the tables are a little more equal uh, than they would be they would be otherwise uh, on behalf of this of this new important industry. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about that because the press has been, I want to say ruthless, but maybe I need to define ruthless. Maybe I'll also say intentionally not accurate with a growing percentage of that being the case, which is even worse than ruthless. So, um, you know, there seems to be some perhaps funding behind it. I'm taking a guess there from the meat industry. That would be a guess. But whatever is going on in the press, it seems calculated and um, not with a regard for facts. And that seems to be happening with an in increased frequency. Can you comment on, on that? What do you think is going on there? Yeah. I, I mean, I think we've seen a number of meat industry operatives going around uh, industry conferences and saying, we need to fight back against alternative products. These, these are taking off this has popularity, particularly with younger consumers, and we need to oppose them. And, and uh, we, you know, it, it's often hard to know exactly what's happened behind closed doors, but we know these pitches are being made. And then we know that there are campaigns coming out the other side that are trying to tar the reputation of the alternative protein industry. And um, I have to think that a lot of the media that has, has been generated attacking plant-based meat in particular in, in the, over the last year has been the result of a lot of this uh, campaigning. So I, I think you're absolutely right to suspect that. Uh, and I think that in particular, you're seeing this sort of very um, disingenuous attack on plant-based meat products as unhealthy, as processed, as unnatural, uh, which of course coming from the meat industry uh, is, is really incredible. Uh, so <laughs> I think, um, yeah, I think that, that there is this kind of a, um, coordinated attack going on. And I, I think I'm, I'm hopeful that journalists uh, will start to sort of wake up to what they're being, uh, what they're being fed uh, by the industry or front groups representing the industry. Um, but I think, I think it's also incumbent on, on players in the whole protein space to, to push back and, and make clear uh, the really positive case for these products. Mm -hmm. So let's go over some of the positive cases, folks, just to um, run this through. It's probably not intuitive, but meat has no fiber. So you look at it, you think it must have fiber. It's, it looks like it's fibrous, but it actually has no fiber. Very difficult to be healthy if you don't have fiber in a very long digestive tract. So meat has no fiber. Plant-based foods will have alternatives, will have some fiber. But most importantly, meat has cholesterol, plant-based products won't. Meat induces trimethylene and oxide, very bad for your heart. Plant-based alternatives don't. And then of course, meat's going to have antibiotics and hormones. Plant-based alternatives won't. So you're getting a lot of a healthier option there. And then the meat industry is the industry that coined the phrase and defined the sector of processed meats. Those would be class one carcinogens, according to the World Health Organization. Things like deli meats, sausages, bacon, hot dogs, things we send our kids to school with for lunch, class one carcinogens, not going to be the case with plant-based alternatives. So you see much healthier, a step in the right direction. Obviously the plant-based burger, a carrot. No, it is not. So if you would like to have a salad or a carrot, then you should eat a salad or a carrot. But if you're looking for that taste of a burger, one is clearly a healthier option than the other, despite negative media of late. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, it reminds me a little bit of the tobacco wars, how for a long time tobacco was spending to have doctors say smoking is healthy until finally they just couldn't have, couldn't get away with that kind of messaging anymore. Yeah, I think I, I think that there will be a point where a number of these trends converge. The concern about climate, the concern about human health, the concern about animal welfare, 
where I think that people will, will start to reject the kind of messaging that we're seeing. And, and, you know, I think that's a real, um, I think that's something that the old protein companies should lean into is that um, yes, they are for the reasons you said, probably healthier than the meat products they're replacing, but more importantly than that, they have dramatically lower uh, carbon footprints and, and dramatically lower, I mean, no uh, animal impacts. And um, so I think it's, it's, you know, it's not just about these aspects of health though, they're important. Um, there's this whole confluence of, of, of factors. Uh, and I think really in the industry's playbook, they'd like to reduce this just down to, well, which has more protein or, you know, which of these has more of one particular micronutrient, uh, you know, and I think in reality, that's not what consumers are ultimately going to care about. Yes, because ultimately it's not which has more protein. It's what package does your protein come in? Do you want that protein with saturated fat, cholesterol, trimethylin oxide, hormones, and antibiotics? Or do you just want protein with fiber? So uh, quite different. I know from our perspective in VegTech Invest, we really embrace this concept of emissions avoidance. So when one is investing in alternative proteins for us, we call it plant-based innovation. That would be plant-based foods, precision, biomass, fermentation in precision and biomass proteins and cultivated meat. So all of those fall into a plant-based innovation umbrella. They're not making the emissions to begin with. So you don't have to buy carbon credits or carbon offsets. You have this concept of emissions avoidance compared to its analog product, which can immediately bring down the carbon footprint of one's investment portfolio. So that's exciting as we think about, you know, individuals looking as they read packages, ooh, what's the carbon footprint here? And as people start to get in, again, this zeitgeist, the culture is changing, not only is animal welfare rising to the top, but people are thinking about, well, what's my carbon footprint and what kind of um, action do I want to make in the world today? Because we make a, an action daily. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And I think um, in addition to individuals, there's been some really exciting progress at the more institutional level. So particularly in Europe, we've been seeing a number of retailers like Tesco, like Lidl, uh, a number of food service companies like Compass Group and Aramark making commitments to reduce as a percentage, their percentage of animal proteins and increase as a percentage, the amount of plant proteins in their offerings. And that's been driven a lot by uh, climate concerns, by recognizing that if you have a corporate uh, target, to reach net zero or to just significantly cut emissions, it's very hard to do so while still serving a, a very sort of animal product heavy uh, uh, offering. And so I think we're only gonna see more of that. I think we're gonna see more and more of these, of these companies starting to lead in actively promoting these products, actively um, pushing to, to have greater options around plant-based proteins, um, both because consumers are demanding it, but also because it's, it's really important from a, from a climate perspective and a, and a co corporate social responsibility perspective. Mm -hmm. I love this. I always think it's like free bonus without any capital outlay, without mm -hmm. having to hire more people, without any capital investment. You can bring down your carbon footprint just by switching up what you offer in the cafeteria. I'll give everybody a tactical example. LinkedIn in San Francisco ran a test program and they took their cafeteria two-thirds plant-based. So not even 100% plant-based. You could still get meat if you wanted it, but you'd have to reach a little further. The meat was in the back and the vegetables were up forward. By making that menu two-thirds plant-based, uh, they were able to reduce everyone's meat intake without them even really realizing realizing it or missing it uh, by 55%. And they were able to reduce that monthly carbon footprint by 14,000 kilograms CO2. So just think you are the food and beverage manager of LinkedIn and you're like, okay, boss, look at my great report card. Boom. Mm -hmm. I just delivered the company, this carbon reduction. And I, I think it's meaningful and I'm, I'm so excited to see it. The one question I would have for you, because I do see corporations going that way and I do see the consumer going that way. And I see governments going this way. I see industry as making these promises for better cages, et cetera, and then not sticking to it. So saying like, sure, sure, we'll do that by 2027. And then they don't. Yeah. Is that accurate? Sure. Yeah. So that when it comes to the corporate uh, animal welfare policies, it, it really does come down to the individual company. What we've seen uh -huh. so far is that of the uh, corporate commitments to get rid of cages, for instance, that came to you by last year, over 90% of them were implemented on time. Uh, oh. So the majority of companies implementing, and that's that's not just them doing it on their own, I should say. You know, it's a lot of advocacy from 
advocates, from investors, from consumers saying we want you to stick to those policies and we want you to implement them. Uh, there are there are going to be a few companies that are going to, I mean, there already have been a few companies that have broken their promises. There'll be more that will break them. I think it's exactly what we see as well on companies with their uh, climate commitments, where some companies will blow through those commitments. Some of them will delay them. Uh, but it's ultimately much better that they make those commitments. <laughs> then we need to make sure they stick to them. Um, but I think the I, th I think really the takeaway is we need the commitments. We also need a lot of work to make sure that companies follow through and, and, and make good on their commitments. I'll go with 90 percent. I like those <laughs> odds. 90 percent works for me. That's pretty yeah. good. And I, I know the advocates out there look just like you do. And I, I know they're they're raising hell. So uh, mm -hmm. they'll go get that last 10 percent. And I do love those folks. Let's drill down a little bit. When I look at the programs you invest in, I see a lot of focus on younger generations and I see a lot of focus on information disbursement. Um, and then I looked at some of your studies at the Oth Open Philanthropy Project about what philanthropy is successful and why. And I wondered if you could answer, it's kind of a long question, but it's twofold, why you focus on younger generations and information disbursement. And if you could compare and contrast, let's say the growth of the alt-right movement or the conservative political movement, and contrast it to the growth of the environmental and animal welfare movement. They've both really grown, but for completely different reasons, they've both been successful. But let's first start um, on youth and information. Why those? Yeah, well, you know, I, I think we don't set out with any particular approach. So what we normally try and do is say, we're going to go into this area. So we're going to go into factory, in the area of factory farming, and, and we want to do the most we can to have the greatest impact. And then we just try and analyze the set of opportunities in front of us and, and the opportunities we could create. And when we, we've done that, I think we've, we've often ended up uh, in places focused around some of the most effective advocacy we've seen out there. Now, I think a lot of those, that advocacy does tend to be done by young people. Uh, a lot of it tends to focus on young people. I don't want to give the impression, though, that we're only <laughs> focused on youth. I mean, I think, um, I think that ultimately what we're looking for is where can we have the greatest impact. And... Um, you know, then when it comes to uh, movements like the climate movement, I actually know much, much less about about uh, the alt right or uh, conservative movements, and so I, I, I'm probably not well placed to to, to um, describe that. But I think on the on the climate movement, I think it's been really encouraging to see the combination of a major grassroots movement globally, but also this this becoming something that elite audiences can't avoid as a topic. So the fact that government uh, prime ministers, presidents are expected to have an answer. CEOs are now expected to have an answer about what they're doing on climate change. I think that's been an amazing uh, transition within the last 10, 20 years. Um, and I'm optimistic that we'll get there on animal issues as well. Uh, now, clearly, there's a long way still to go on climate change. Uh, but I do think that, that we're seeing both of these issues be elevated in terms of their importance. And I think that comes from a mixture of, of the grassroots. Um, but it also comes from, from that influence within, within elite circles. I'll I'll just tell everyone because I'm certainly not uh, the person to talk about it either but I read about it on your website it was interesting so go to openphilanthropy.org and it's kind of a tale of two movements so from what the website was saying just gross oversimplification the growth of the conservative political movement kind of came from strategy and investment early on over decades to push a certain message forward for the political gain of a small group. And the environmental and animal welfare growth comes from the exact opposite. No one group is heading it up. No one source of income is leading it. No one specifically benefits. They We kind of all benefit. And it's, it's the power of grassroots kind of by definition and how juxtaposed and starkly different that is. And yet they both have had successful outcomes. So I don't know what intellectual conclusion I'm trying to draw here, except I thought it was super interesting when I read about it, how these two have both been able to survive. I would have naturally thought grassroots won't last. If it doesn't yeah. have the money and the strategy and an organized leader, it won't last. And that hasn't been the case. Of course, we have the tailwind of the planet crashing underneath our feet. So maybe that's part of it. But just very interesting. If you want to go to openflanthropy.org and dig in the website, you can read about that. Um, well, you've been so gracious with your time today. I have a couple quick kind of rapid fire exit questions for you. 
first I'll ask, um, I know you mentioned in the green room together before we started that Dustin, one of the founders of Facebook, is pretty hands off, just wants to do the most good he can, and then he leaves it to the experts such as yourself. But um, do you ever get like a note or an email or even like a meeting once a year that says, good job, I like what we're doing on animal welfare? Does he comment at all? Yeah, you know, he's actually he's he's tweeted about it even. So uh, one one better. So, yeah, no, I know that um, uh, Dustin and Carrie are, are very excited about the impact we've been able to have on on farm animal welfare and have, have been hugely supportive of, of these efforts and, of course, are, are funding all of this important work, too. Yeah, so beautiful. So beautiful. OK, so all the incredible work that you've done, uh, any predictions you'd like to make? Let's say I used to say when I started this show 10 years and then things just kept moving so quickly. Uh, we didn't even get to talk about AI. Uh, it's not really your area, of course, of investing. But, you know, you do invest in what could go wrong with AI or open philanthropy does. And um, certainly an interesting topic. Maybe that's a topic for the all in podcast and I'll leave it to <laughs> them. But uh, um just wondering if you, um, uh, now I've lost my, oh my gosh, I've lost my question that I had for you. Okay, well, I'll cut to what I usually ask people, which is, what do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? Oh, that's a good one. I mean, I think, um, you know, one of our, one of our lessons has been that you need to try out a lot of things and be prepared for them, to fa for some of them to fail. And I think a lot of uh, change, social change is really hard. I think a lot of the, the greatest success we've had has been where we've iterated, we've tried out a number of different things, and then we've doubled down on the things that work and kept trying out new things. Uh, and so, you know, I think that I'd probably be a little less driven by preconceptions of, well, this will work and this won't. Mm -hmm. um, here's a theory of why this might work. And, and more driven by let's let's go and start experimenting and, and start doing some work in the space and seeing what sticks and, and do more of it. And what has stuck? What's had the most success? Well, you know, I mean, certainly I think the corporate uh, campaigns yeah. that we discussed, the corporate policies, I think yeah. all pro alternative protein as, as a field has. I mean, I think as a field, we are just light years ahead of where we were 10 years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's been amazing to see the progress on that front. Uh, and then I think there's been some really exciting legislative progress. So um, I think maybe across those three areas. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. We don't get to talk about it too much on this show, but there's been outstanding legislative progress. And it's often at the state level, but I'll say my state, again, of Illinois, putting mandatory plant-based options in school lunches. You see the state of New York putting uh, plant-forward meals in hospitals. Uh, just tremendous progress being made in in ways that maybe don't get a lot of press, but movement is happening. Uh, of course, I now remember my original question, which was predictions. I used to ask for predictions 10 years out, but um, things are moving so quickly. What, what kind of changes do you see, let's say, for the alternative proteins uh, sector, but also for animal welfare in the next three years? I think it's, I think it's really hard to say uh, because the the area has been sort of volatile so you know mm -hmm. I, I feel more confident in the 20-year trajectory uh that we'll see really substantial growth and i think what you see over the next three years probably depends a lot more about individual companies about where the stock market as a whole is at, where investors as a whole are at yeah. but but you know i think i feel pretty confident in the in the long-term trajectory of the space uh, and so maybe that's that's where I'd, I'd stick my bands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like what you say. Um, I, I still go for short term, uh, probably because I had Jen Bartasha, senior food analyst of Bloomberg Intelligence on the show not too long ago. But she said, you know, you're looking at 2025, 2026, 2027, even the last half of 2023. She's speaking from a couple of public companies in the market. You're going to start to see profitability running those companies a little tighter the way Wall Street would like to see it. So really focusing on profitability and growing that Wall Street base from there. Uh, you bring up an excellent point that we don't get to talk about enough on this show, which is, oh my God, we forget where we've come from. Talk about incredible growth. I just don't mean in the numbers. I mean in the innovation. It is innovation that drives change and drives that S-curve adoption that we've talked about on the show. S-curve adoption meaning kind of mass adoption by the public. So um, we have come so 
far, even just Beyond Meat, for example, you know, you look at the Beyond Meat steak that's out, talk about a clean label with lots of protein and just like a simple clean label, even the burgers, which are on like version three, maybe even version four, you know, much less saturated fat. I mean, just the, the sector, and of course, it's more than just Beyond, but just continuing to innovate, continuing to innovate. And at the beginning of that very exciting innovation curve, whereas animal agriculture really at the end of its innovation curve. So uh, I think it's, it's very exciting. And I'm going to say, let's see, we're 2023. Yeah, this, this time 2026 is going to be just a, a brave new world. It's going to be a completely different um, landscape and it's going to be, we won't be able to like hold back the reins. It'll be growth so fast. Okay. That's my prediction. Um, you are having a busy day and you are running around and your day is not going the way you would like. What is a phrase you tell yourself to get yourself back in the groove? Ooh, uh, you know, I mean, I think reminding myself of the amazing work that people are doing in the space, whether it's advocates, whether it's entrepreneurs, investors. So I don't, I don't have a clean phrase, but I think uh, just sort of reflecting on uh, the the really incredible stuff people are doing, and then the, the the long game, as you were saying, you know, looking ten years back and, and versus today, and just saying, wow, how much people have achieved, how far we've come, and I think feeling a sense of, of gratitude and a sense of excitement about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nose to the grindstone, eyes to the sky. Let's go, people. Uh, my last question for you. So you are running around and maybe it's going your way on that particular day, but you are so busy, you don't have time for lunch. What is your go-to snack? Ooh, uh, if, you know, if I don't have time for lunch, I probably just have like a protein bar or something. Uh, lots of good plant protein bars. Uh, but I've actually I've become a fan lately of Alpha Frozen Vegan Burritos. Uh, they're like oh. a minute and a half in the microwave and, and they, uh, they work very well for a, for a quick lunch. Yeah. Yeah. They're super great. Have you ever tried the cool beans burritos? Ooh, I haven't yet. No, that's a good. Ooh. Good recommendation. Gonna get you some cool bean burritos. Uh, yeah, they're pretty rock star and alpha too. How can you go wrong? I want to thank you, Lewis, for all that you do. Really, Dustin and Carrie, of course, at the Open Philanthropy Project, but the eight person team that handles animal welfare at OPP. I want to thank all of you for all that you do, your vision, your steadfastness, your nose to the grindstone, never give up, um, always at it perspective. So thank you for all you do. And um, any way I can help you, please consider me a resource. I am here to be of help to you. Thank you. And thanks for all you're doing. Oh, so kind of you. Okay, you don't go away, Lewis, but everybody else on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter, I will, of course, see you next week. Thank you, everybody, also for all you do. Thank you always for listening, but really, thank you for all you do, because every day, three times a day, we do make a difference. So I love that you are pulling up as you go up, and it's all charges ahead. Everybody, I will see you next week. Lewis, stay put. Bye, everybody.